This is a bioreactor design that my wife came up with with me. She got tired of washing clothes after I was doing windrow composting by hand. Uh, we had several issues in this design of what we wanted to accomplish. Number one, we wanted to make it uh, transportable so it could be batched at a central location, picked up, moved, set, and just left to, to compost. We also understood that uh, in a composting process, the oxygen will only penetrate about one foot into that compost. So in the design, we incorporated a pipe in the filling phase to leave a channel. We, we build it on a, a pallet so air can flow in the bottom. And we put pipe in temporarily to these holes as we fill the reactor. And that allows, when you pull it out, that allows air to flow up through the center. And in the design, you're never more than one foot away from ambient air anywhere in this pile. So that allows this process to be aerobic. It also allows you to have no smells. It also, uh, which is the number one reason why composting process, uh, processing centers are closed in the US. The second reason is pollution of water resources. This particular reactor, it will take a lot of rain without any leaching. So you have no pollution of groundwater sources. It, it solved two of the biggest problems in the US for uh, composting processes. Plus, it enabled the fungal community to go in and change, uh, to reduce the salinity. Now we're not changing, we're not doing any transmutation in this. Most likely what is happening is since we have a high fungal population, you have excretion of oxalic acid. Fun fungi will excrete oxalic acid to break down organic material around them, but they also use it to drill through, they can drill straight through granite and pick up the elements in that substrate to be able to transport it to plants. But uh, oxalic acid can form with positive uh, metal ions and form an oxalate, which will tie up. Sodium is an uh, a, a positive metal ion, and that, in its, its case, can tie up sodium so it doesn't show up on a soil test. Materials, it's just a pallet with six evenly spaced, four and a half inch holes. We use landscaping cloth. We use the woven landscaping cloth, not the felt, because it holds up better. Uh, there'll be three pieces of that, two six by six for the top and the bottom, and then six by, should be six by 12 foot, six inches long, because it's a 12 foot uh, radius, not radius, but circumference once you build this up. We use concrete remesh. It's a six by six by number 10. It's common. All these are common materials that you'll find just about anywhere. Uh, the remesh is used in concrete form or foundations. We use six perforated plastic pipe, and they're only in there for one day. After you build the pile up, you let it sit for one day, and the fungal hyphae have completely stabilized the pile enough you can pull these pipe out. I'll show you a little video of it here in a minute. And also, you need a sprinkler system. Uh, I think it's best if you put it automatic, because if you have a memory like mine, you're not going to remember to water this thing. <laughs> but it only takes one minute a day irrigation just to keep it wet enough for the biological action to proceed. If you're filling by hand, which hopefully this will eventually be mechanized, uh, but this is the way I do it at the house. I have the material that I want to compost. In this case, it just happened to be all leaves. And I wet them in a bath and then throw them up in the wheelbarrow while they drain. I'll fill another batch and let this, that soak. I'll fill the buckets up and go put it in the reactor. Also, this bath helps in another respect that as you put these leaves in there, eventually all the sand or rocks, everything will settle to the bottom. So you get a clean compost. You can actually get a shovel and scoop out all the sand and rocks. So it, it gives you a very clean compost in the end. These are the pipes. 
as I was talking about. They're just in there to give you a form to allow you to, to pl place the composted material in. Now with the leaves, I do press it a little bit, not too much. Uh, most, uh, well, when I first started this, I used a ratio one third by volume of dairy manure, uh, wood chips, three eighths minus, three eighths inch minus, and uh, yard waste, similar to this. And I would not compact that, I would just let it use its own weight to fill it up. Because you, you do need a, a certain density in this material so you allow that air to flow. You don't want to compact it too much. You'll know if you have, because if it's done correctly, there's no smells, and there's no flies, and there's no odors whatsoever, but you do get a, if you do it wrong, you will know. It will smell. And after I say, after that, that day, I just pull the pipe out. And if you want, <coughs> there's a video on YouTube that allow you to look at this, it's narrated. But it's a rather easy process. It's something, you know, it takes about four hours to fill it. Uh, I let it set as long as I can, hopefully up to a year. The leaves only took about a little over six months and it had that consistency of clay. But it's a very aggressive uh, composting process. It will heat up to about 165 degrees if, if put together right for three days and then it's done. The temperature will start to go down. Eventually it'll reach, reach ambient temperature. So it can fulfill, I don't know if you have regulations, but we do in the US for EPA that it has to be in a static batch reactor. It has to reach 131 degrees for three days and this will fulfill that objective. But after the uh, the thermophilic phase or the heat, heat phase of this, I'll put worms in and they will completely populate the pile. And that's a, one of the a perimeter irrigation system where it's just a half inch landscape hose, holds, I drill one thirty-second inch holes every four inches all the way around the perimeter. And also the other two, other three were those spray emitters, you've probably seen them for landscaping, but I'll put the perimeter plus, like I'll show you here. <laughs> After the thermophilic phase, after about, it gets to 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. That's, that way they can survive pretty well, but uh, when you open it up, it's completely populated with worms. So it's a great media to be able to add. If you're a gardener, this is great. <laughs> 62 pounds of tomatoes on one plant with this. Oh no, it, to get down to 80 it would probably be about a week and a half. This is, a, in that heating process, it goes pretty fast. Here you see it spraying. Uh, yeah, you can see. And that's only one minute a day. You just want to replace the amount of water uh, that, you've, that you have in the pile. You're not trying to leach through it. But it does make a very aggressive environment. Uh, Never. Never touch it. You don't need to. That's the nice thing about this. And it makes great compost besides. <laughs> what sort of weather? Hmm? What sort of weather conditions? I, I see down to minus 16 up to 108. Oh, 113. No. Uh, but we were temperate. You know, it may be cold at night, but it will warm up to 50, 40 in the daytime. But then I, do, I cover it after I get it to this point and let it do what nature does. You know, and I think that's the biggest thing about this. It's not disturbed, where if you're doing windrow composting, it's like somebody coming to your house and throwing all your furniture out in the yard every day, and you have to re furnish your apartment after that. So we're allowing the fungal hyphae to populate. And, I, and they will, they stabilize that pile really well. I 
think that's about it. You can, if you want, if you want to inoculate. I didn't. Uh, um, and when I did an analysis on this, the first piles that I made, I analyzed what microbes were in there. And I found microbes that were first discovered in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, pelagic or ocean-going bacteria and intestinal bacteria in that pile in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So as a microbiologist, I'm always say, thinking, and a lot of people do, that everything is everywhere. It's just you create the right environment for them to flourish. I also had one microbe in there that hadn't been seen for 110 years. But they, uh, back when Pasteur was looking at microbes, this particular uh, variety, it's, uh, it makes a scarlet colored microbial community. And I noticed that in the pile too. So we have no clue what goes on in this world. We're just now learning. We have the technology, as I was saying. We have the phone book. If everybody that's there, we don't know what they do. But we, we do have a phone book now, which before this, they all look the same. You know, a bacteria is a bacteria, but now we're able to go down even to species and subspecies level with these analytical processes. And <clears throat> hopefully, that'll allow me to start looking at soils and at composts and see what the difference is you know, between uh, maybe I can get <coughs> marker species that might indicate, well, this is a healthy soil, or, or marker communities even that I'll be able to do. But that's a little ways away. Uh, computing power is an issue on this because there is so much diversity. But we're also able to get the metabolic functions of this whole community. And that has proven more informative in uh, the Human Genome Project, as far as looking at us and how we, how we survive and how we do well, that they've found more correlations to the m metabolics of the process this is going on in the system than the actual microbes. Because microbes can change function. You know, uh, bacteria, at single cells, they have specific capabilities. But once they get into a community structure, and we call this quorum sensing, that they can actually do specializations. This community can branch this part off to do a certain process, or this part of the community to do another process. So it's, it's probably the very first organizational uh, advance towards organs doing cell specialization. And that's microbes do this. In, and we're ta not talking linear, relationships between these organisms. We're talking dynamic, where this one can affect this one while also affecting that one back regulating to another one. And this is going to be tremendously complex, but why not look at it? You know, that's, that's what I like to do. And that's, I have a decent community to look at now that Joint Genome Institute has shown some interest in. I'll be talking to their uh, head guy in January on this, of possibly getting the government to help. <laughs> of course, you know, that could be good, it could be bad, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Any other questions? Oh, it'd be able, well, it would be the inoculation with the microbes, just like I'm doing in the soils of, uh, of uh, cropland. In cropland, it's much easier to apply this because you, you're doing more processes. You have more control in how, how you approach it. Rangeland, we've got to work that out. Uh, as the same Terry has been using uh, extracts and spraying it out. And that seems to be working. That's worked for Elaine Ingham. You know, she's been doing that for years, and she sees a dramatic improvement in, in rangeland. In fact, in one place in Texas, they saw species come back after an application of compost tea, excuse me, that ranchers hadn't seen there for over 40 years. 
and this was in a short period of time, it's having the right biology. These plants can do things that if they're struggling in a, well, it's just like us. If our stomach is out of order, we're, we're a mess. We are not functional. And we take this for granted much of the time. But when it's out of order, we're on our knees. And I think soils are not much different. David, how, how are you doing it in a, in a cropping situation? And you've got a clay-like compost. Are you spreading that out? To all? Well, this, uh, I had been, I started out with uh, just spreading it about four to 500 pounds per acre. And then I found out now that since we see we can inoculate the seeds and plant it in, I mean, I can use a couple of liters of a slurry of this compost, treat enough seed to do uh, at least a hectare. So water injection at the plant? Yeah, I, you could do water injection with it. You could uh, drip it into, if you're doing irrigation, flood irrigation, you can drip it into flood. You can spray it on a field. I've sprayed also. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not sure exactly what that threshold is of what you need, but it looks like if you get the microbes there with the plant, this thing's going to take off handily. I, so has the plant got to be grown? Obviously not if you're inoculating a seed. It goes on at any time, pre-plant, post-plant, at plant? Uh, most of mine is pre, but I have done post as once. It was, you know, I've tried it several different ways, but it's, it looks like it transfers pretty well either with inoculating the seed. That seems to be the best to me right now. I need to do a trial to, to check it, but you know, it doesn't take a lot, evidently, to do this. I mean, there's a lot of spores. And that's, that's what this compost, I think, gives you. It, you've taken that material you're trying to compost, and you've broken it down just about the basic elements. There's nothing left for a, a microbe to be able to digest at that point. And so what they're going to do, what a fungi is going to do, is it's going to sporulate. It's going to form a whole bunch of spores to prepare for when conditions are ripe, when there's something to break down. And I think bacteria are going to be the same way. They're going to insist. And um, that means they can survive high temperatures, desiccation. And you're just putting spores on that field. I'm, I'm thinking that's probably what's going on since we can use it in such small amounts that you see these responses. So would you retreat every crop or? I think as economical, if, if I'm having to put just a, a liter of microbes on my seeds, and I'm, if I'm getting better germination, yes. It's so inexpensive. It just seems like, why not do it? You know? Once you're following that one, if your seed is wet, the plant is not a good thing. Well, What I saw was about 10% less germ, germination on it. But you still get the effect of the uh, Still got the effect. Okay. Uh, as you can see, though, the wet treated grew faster. By 10%? Yeah. Well, no, it actually grew faster. Oh, okay. it, it, it had eight days less growing, but it had surpassed the growth of all the other two treatments. So yeah. wet, you know, I thought you know, there would be some issues in a drill. But I saw the flow characteristics of that wet treated being a lot better than dry. So I think you might be able to, to drill this in wet. You know, and if your soil's reasonably damp, I think it would take better. So a lot of this is conjecture <coughs> at this point, but from what I've seen and the experiments that I've run, I think it's a pretty safe statement to make. Yes, sir. Talk about your, uh, your recipe for sticking up the seed. Oh, yes, what I use is a, a milk and molasses mix, eight to one, and I uh, just pour it in uh, with the compost till I get a slurry that's about like pancake batter, if you're a cook. Slurry what? Eight, eight to one, milk to molasses, and just pour enough in there to get it to a slurry. Something that you can, I put my seed in a cement mixer and pour about a liter in there and, and, and coat the seed and go from there. But yes. milk would not be um, pasteurized or? Um, you know, I, I use organic. 
uh, you know, why venture That's anywhere very, else? Very fair yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> Except for that morning at 5 a.m. and then that evening. <laughs> Is that on YouTube? Yes. Yes, it is. Once you've had it in that nice piece of well mesh for 12 months and it's ready, what, how long have you got to, right, well, how long have you got to, got to use it? Have you got to, will it last for another well, couple of years? Or you I would imagine, you know, if it doesn't go through any really high temperatures or extreme desiccation, I would imagine it, because Fungi and insisted bacteria, the, the spores, they can last for centuries. So, you know, that's how this planet has been able to survive all the cataclysmic events. You know, there's, there's microbes able to bring it back. Do you water for 12 months? You want to keep it moist. You know, I, at that point, I don't think I'd water it as often, but I would want to keep it wet, especially if, uh, you know, the worms will eventually leave too because they'll vacate if there's not enough material. They're interested in survival, but I've, I've noticed if you let it sit long enough, the worms are gone. So. David, in a, in a non-organic cropping system, in the use of other insecticides or herbicides, do they affect the fun fungi? I would ex expect that they do. And also, uh, new studies on glyphosate. Application at one one hundredth the recommended rate will kill half the fungi in a soil. Application at one fiftieth of the rate will kill most all of them. So it's, this is aspergillus. This is the one that just happens to be able to, the study was done on it. It's able to break down, um, I can't remember the name now, one of the really toxic chemicals in our, that we've been putting in our soil. But that application, the glyphosate, glyphosate was first registered as an antimicrobial. And it was also registered as a um, chelator. It would tie up minerals in the soil and hold them. So those two issues, from my perspective, seeing the influence of biology, if you can avoid it, avoid it. I know some will have to spray. But it's getting less and less effective. You know, at least we're seeing our purple amaranth it grows handsomely after you spray it. <laughs> so you know, if you can realize this is a living organism and you need to treat it as much as you can like a living organism, realizing that its life depends on what you do. And it, those four principles that Terry talked about, you know, food, water, air, what was it for? Shelter. Thank you. <laughs> Those need to be, you know, you need to look at it like another animal that you're taking care of on the farm. You know, so it does take care and upkeep. And it will take care of you. I mean, you can see how much you can increase productivity. Um, I know the transition is tough. But once you get there, I think it's all worth it. And I think most of the ranchers and farmers that I've talked to that have been pursuing this, they're so happy that they did bite the bullet and do this on their farms and ranches. You know, they're, they're much happier. They're able to grow stuff much more effectively. They're able to weather droughts much better than their neighbors. Uh, they're able to have healthier animals. They're able to see the aquifers on their lands increase level just from that extra water infiltration, from changing that soil to hold the water and to infiltrate that water. So there's too many pluses on this, it seems like, to not to try it. You know. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Some people do it through uh, the uh, circles, you know, and run it. I was putting it at 15 gallons per acre on an extract. Uh, no, of a, a drip. Uh, and I used about 20 pounds of the compost per 90 gallons of water. 
and I just did a bubbling. Uh, I think Terry has a better <coughs> extraction methodology of actually pushing the water through the system, but uh, I'm low tech. Trust me, on the budget I get to do research, I am low tech. <laughs> I've been lucky. 